happy? To sure. Yeah. yeah. Let's get started. Um, thank you guys for joining us. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Shaheen. And uh, we are running this Agile launch for a couple of years now. Every last Friday of the month, we get together. Um, this time, because it was a very long weekend coming along, it's the third Friday of the month. Um, I want to thank Marianne a lot. She helped us a lot for uh, getting Mike here and organizing this session. So please give her a round of applause. <laughs> thank you, Mike, for, for coming. I know you have a very busy uh, schedule. And thank you guys for attending. As if it wasn't for you guys, we wouldn't have this session. So please give yourself and Mike a big round of applause. <laughs> Again. And one more big round of applause for Mackenzie for hosting us and providing us lunch. They are very uh, great. Um, I, I don't tend to talk too much, but I want to uh, introduce Mike. I know him. The first time that I met him was at the coach retreat. Um, five years ago, I believe, uh, and then from that moment on, I know that uh, Mike is a person to learn from, so I keep um, connected. I didn't get the chance to work with him directly, but I learned from him a lot, and um, we, we are very, um, um, we are very uh, honor, honored, and we are very lucky to have him here. Thank you, Mike. I leave um, the Thank proper you. introduction to himself. Thank you. So I am Mike Moeller, I'm a longtime Agile coach. I started my Agile journey in 1999 with XP and have been doing it for the last 20 years. Um, I am also, in addition to being a, an Agile coach, I am also a trained hypnotist. And what we're gonna talk about today comes out of the neuroscience and psychology behind all of that. So we're gonna be talking about anxiety. I'm gonna give you some, some concrete, hard tools for releasing anxiety really quickly uh, because anxiety is so prevalent in what we do today. And of course, you've, you've all noticed that it's really hard to help somebody who is highly anxious or highly stressed. And it's really difficult to help those people if you yourself are in that place of anxiety or stress. So I'm gonna show you some quick techniques to let go of it. Now, this doesn't mean that it's gonna fix the underlying problem right away, but it makes you feel a whole lot better right away. There's no point in feeling crappy, even if there is some deeper thing that, that you might need to get at later. So, Last summer, I was working down in Dallas, Texas. I work a lot in the US. And if you've ever been to Dallas or in Texas anywhere in the heat of the, the peak of summer, you know how hot it is. I heard a couple of people already talking about how warm it was coming over here today, but that's nothing like Texas. Texas is like when you're cooking something in the oven and you open the oven door to check on it, you get that blast of heat that comes up. Well, it's just like that, except instead of the quick blast, it's like you walked inside the oven and did some laps. That's what Texas is like in the summer. So of course you can't go out for a walk during the day because you just, it, it's unbearable. So one evening I was out for a walk after dusk when the, the shadows were lengthening, it was getting a little bit dark and I was out in a wooded area walking through this path, enjoying myself, I had my earbuds in, I was listening to something and as I'm walking down this path, all of a sudden I froze in place and my eyes tracked towards a stick on the path up ahead. And I'm thinking to myself, what, what possible reason could I have for stopping where I was and for watching the stick because it made no sense to me. What's this all about? Until the stick began to move. <laughs> and I realized that it wasn't a stick at all, it was a snake. So yeah, after a moment, the, the snake lost interest in me, it slithered away in the grass and I sort of chuckled to myself for having this, this reaction and I moved on. Now let's consider for a moment what actually went on in my brain and in my body in that moment. So I was walking along, I was in what we call rest and digest state, down here. So we're in this rest and digest when everything is calm and relaxed and I'm walking down the path, I'm having a good time because I'm listening to something, I'm relaxed. All of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye, my, my, the information about that snake or what I thought at the time was a stick came in through my eyes, hit the visual cortex. The visual cortex is a surprisingly large part of our brain, accounting for about half of our total brain volume that's devoted to image processing. So it did a whole bunch of pattern matches to figure out what was there, and it determined that what was ahead of me might be a danger. Now, it didn't know for sure it was a danger, it might have been a stick, but it might have been dangerous. And so that information then made its way back to my amygdala. The amygdala is about halfway back on the underside of the brain, and it is part of the primitive parts of our brain. It's part of what we might call the reptilian brain. It's there to protect us, to keep us alive. 
So the amygdala recognized that there might be a danger ahead, but it wasn't too close. It was still a little bit further off, and so it kicked me into a freeze response. And it did that by activating the sympathetic nervous system, which goes up this side. So we've got two parts of the, the atomic nervous system, which are the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. And the sympathetic is designed to take us from rest and digest all the way up into this panic state. So up here, we're either fight, flight, or freeze. In this case, it was a freeze response, but it could have just as easily been a fight or flight. So it, it did this total, what we call body catalepsy, which is just paralysis. Because we do, our brains have these chemicals to allow us to be totally paralyzed. I don't know if you're aware, but when you're sleeping and dreaming, your body is actually in a state of paralysis to prevent you from fly, flailing around when you're dreaming. Because as you move through a dream, your body needs to stay common, so you are in a full state of paralysis. So it put me into that state right away, except for my eyes, which attract towards the object, the motion called a saccade. So all of this happened immediately. As the sympathetic nervous system went up, my pupils immediately dilated to restrict the amount of information that's coming in, so that it's focused just on the danger up ahead and not on all the things around the periphery. It started withdrawing blood from my extremities. If you've ever been in a state of shock, you notice your fingers go white. The blood is actually being pulled inwards towards the center of your body. And it's doing that so that if you are in a fight or you get cut in some way, you're not bleeding out over the ground. It's survival. Your blood is coming inwards. The adrenaline starts pumping, so I'm getting ready. My heart rate is going up. I start bringing more oxygen into my lungs. I'm getting ready for that fight or flight. Now in this moment, I've only gone into a freeze reaction, but it's getting me ready to move to do something extremely strenuous and active. Cortisol is starting to flood through my system and cortisol is getting me to that hyper aware state so that I'm, I'm ready to do things. We've got glucose being pumped into the muscles so we're freeing up all kinds of fat deposits, we're releasing energy into the bloodstream and forcing it into our, our muscles. If you've ever noticed that sometimes you get a startle and then your hands start to shake, that's because you've got so much glucose in your muscles it has to burn it off somehow. So you start to shake to burn off that glucose. So we got all the glucose coming in, and then because we need all this extra energy, it starts to shut down non-essential services. So it shuts down growth. My fingernails stop growing. My hair stops growing. It shuts down my immune system, because in this quick moment of panic, when I'm, I'm in immediate danger, I don't need my immune system. My immune system is all about long-term health, not about short-term health, so I shut that down. Then lastly, I shut down the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is where we do our higher level thinking. So it's completely shut down. We're in a react mode at this point. So all of this, within seconds, I'm up in this full mode because there's a potential danger up ahead. Then the snake slithers away, and my brain says, oh, it's okay again. And so now it activates the parasympathetic. It's not just a matter of turning this one off. It actually activates a whole new system that's designed to counteract everything we just did and take us back down to a known state. So it tries to reduce some of the cortisol, it's, it stops the flow of adrenaline, it gets our, our heart rate slowly moving back down again, uh, and then eventually it restarts all of these, these services. Now if this happens occasionally, it's not a big deal. Our, brain, our body is designed for this. We get into that heightened state and then we come back down again. The problem is when we're going through this cycle on a regular basis, because my brain can't distinguish between a real threat, like the snake on the, the path, and a fake threat, like my boss saying, you have to have this done by tomorrow. They're both threats. They both activate this fight flight response. And so when we're going through this cycle on a regular basis, it's incredibly stressful in our body as we're getting ourselves up to a heightened state and then right back down again. And we're doing this constantly all day long. And that's what we call stress. And I don't know if the word stress comes because it's stressful on the body, but it's a very appropriate word. So, when we're feeling that state of anxiety, we're typically going through this cycle over and over again. So all the techniques I'm gonna show you today are gonna to do one of three things. They're either going to make it less likely that you're gonna trigger this one in the first place because you're, you're more relaxed. It's going to explicitly trigger this one to force us back down again, or it's gonna do something to explicitly lower the cortisol levels in your system because cortisol is what's causing the glucose being pushed into the muscles and it's what's feel, causing that real crappy feeling that we have when we're we're feeling anxious, that's all cortisol. So if we can lower the cortisol level in our body, and there's some things that we can do to lower it quite quickly, then we can do that. So the three things, making it less likely to trick this, 
forcibly triggering this one to get us back down or dropping the cortisol level directly. Is that all good so far? Yes. Awesome. So the first thing, I'd like you to pick up some object, preferably something that doesn't spill. Um, I did this in a bar a couple of weeks ago and somebody did it with a beer glass. <laughs> all over the floor. So how about we don't break anything? So you can pick up something and I want you to just slowly move this from hand to hand. Slowly. Back and forth. Back and forth. And the reason this works so incredibly well is because when we are in this heightened state of anxiety, when we're constantly stressed, we tend to have highly unbalanced brain activity. If we were to hook you up to an fMRI machine when you were feeling anxious, we would see that the right hemisphere of your brain is lit up like a Christmas tree and the left hemisphere is largely idle. The right hemisphere is where all of your creativity is. So the right hemisphere is coming up with all these wonderful ideas of all the things that could go wrong. Well, what if this happened? And what if that happened? And what if I missed a deadline? And what if the snake attacks me? And what if this? And what if that? The left side, the one that is currently dormant, is the one that can shut that down and say, that's not now. Because only the left hemisphere understands time. It realizes that isn't now. Let it go. It's the left hemisphere that understands logic, that can say, no, that's really not happening. But the right hemisphere, when it's fully active, is doing that. So what we're doing here is by forcing the two hemispheres to talk to each other by coordinating this object back and forth, we're rebalancing that brain activity so that the right hemisphere becomes less active and the left hemisphere becomes more active and we become much less stressed. And you can do that at any time just to calm down. Now, I do caution you, I've seen people that try to do it like this. <laughs> that, that is not helping because you're not getting the hemispheres to talk to each other. It has to be nice and slow. There is a whole field of study called EMDR that is all based on this principle of rebalancing brain activity. Uh, I'm not gonna get into that, but they do things with tracking light motion. They do things with, with headphones where there's a sound on either side. Uh, you can do things just tapping. I've done that for myself a couple of months ago. My mother got uh, rushed to the hospital and I had a two hour drive to get down to the hospital. As you might imagine, I was a little bit anxious when I got in the car to start driving. So as I'm driving, because I can't be passing the steering wheel back and forth, that would not work. I just started tapping on the steering wheel, tap, 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 and I would calm right down. And then I'd get bored because I'm not stressed anymore and I'm still tapping and so I'd stop tapping and the anxiety would start to come back up again. And so I'd start to tap and I went through these cycles of I'd, I'd tap until I was bored, and then I would stop, and then the anxiety, and by the time we'd gone through th uh, this enough cycles, by the time I got down to the hospital, it was completely gone. I was calm, and I was in a place where I could help her, which was the whole point. Okay, so that's called bilateral stimulation. So just a question, you could park it if you want. Does it also mean that imply that there's a certain level of stress is good, like it's the adrenaline of, of High yes. Okay. Yes, a certain a small amount of stress are positive and do help us do things. Stress is a a genuinely useful thing that our bodies are designed for that it's designed to protect us. And so small amounts of stress are good. What's not good is when it's constant and when it's really intense. It's the constant part that, that really kills us. Yes. So all of this, right, going into the step three, but how can we, you know, effectively measure whether we are in stress? Because sometimes we don't even realize that. Right, so, okay, so there's, there's two parts to that. The, the first part is that we typically know when we're feeling um, in that place, it, we'll feel it in our gut, we just, you know, that we've got butterflies or we, we're just feeling horrible. And we, so we can typically tell that. If you ask yourself, and I didn't do this ahead of time, I should have, um, on a scale of zero to 10, where 10 is intense, feel where that anxiety is right now. And if you think about that for a moment, so you just think right now, what, how, however you're feeling about that anxiety on a scale of zero to 10, where is it now? Just find that number and typically say it out loud. That alone forces you to switch hemispheres from the right to the left and actually calms you down a little bit, which is odd. But it's one of those benefits. But then if you do this kind of a technique and do it again, you'll find that you're, you're at a much lower number. So had you started at an eight or a nine, you'll now be down to a four or five just after a little bit of passing back and forth. But the other part to that is that sometimes, and I notice this even in myself, you're feeling really crappy. And then all of a sudden it occurs to you, I know how to get rid of that. Why have I been feeling crappy for the last hour? 
it's because you're not in the habit of using these techniques to lower your, your stress level. Does that help? My son's in that place right now. As he was going through exams, he'd be getting all wired up, and I said, I've already shown you the techniques, just do them. Oh, right, right, right. Because he forgot that he knew the techniques. Okay, so that's bilateral stimulation. Um, EMDR is a whole field of study if you're interested in following up on that. Moving on to something else. If you take your tongue and lift it to the roof of your mouth and just let it sit on the roof of your mouth, what this does is it activates the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is the largest nerve in your body. It starts in your brain and moves through every major organ in your body. And if you see it visualized, it's, it's an incredible mass of stuff all through your body. But by lifting your tongue up and activating the vagus nerve, that in turn will trigger the parasympathetic nervous system, which will take you from that intense and anxious state back down to a calm state. Uh, if anybody has done meditation, you'll find that you do, you tend to do long breathing. Uh, martial arts or meditation, you'll find you have the long in and out breathing. That does the same thing. It triggers the vagus nerve, which in turn activates the parasympathetic nervous system. So I tend to do this one at the same time as the jaw drop, so just relax your jaw. We, we is, when we are anxious or angry or stressed, we clench our jaws, and we do this as a survival mechanism, because if I'm in a fight and my jaw breaks off, I'm as good as dead. <coughs> if I can't eat, I'm dead. So as a survival mechanism, the moment we become angry or stressed or we feel in jeopardy in some way, our jaws clench. Well, if we force it to relax, we're sending a message back to the brain saying, no, we're not in danger. If we were in danger, you'd be clenched right now, but I forced you to not clench, therefore we're not in danger. So we're playing head games with our own brain, and it works. So I tend to do these two together because the moment my tongue goes up, my jaw relaxes anyway. You may find the same thing. I like these because you can do them in an office setting. Nobody, nobody knows any better. Somebody's saying something that's stressing me out. Okay, let me just relax my jaw and, and lift my tongue up. That's the vagus nerve, and this is intercepting the, the loop between your body and your brain. Peripheral vision. This is one of my go-tos. I use this one a lot. So I'd like you to find a spot on the wall, something that's not moving. I will stop moving because I notice people tend to want to stare at me anyway, even when I say look at the wall. So find a spot that's not moving, and as you're looking at it right now, you're using what's called your foveal vision, which is your direct centered vision. And now, it's, without moving your eyes, become aware of everything to the, around it, the left and the right, the top and the bottom. Without moving your eyes, just become aware further and further. How far can you expand your awareness out on all sides? And as you start to do that, you're forcing yourself into peripheral vision. And just like with the jaw, you're now sending a signal to your brain that you're not in danger. Because if you were in danger, you would be in foveal vision looking straight ahead with dilated pupils. So you've intercepted that. Now this one has an added bonus. A lot of people have this little voice in their head that says, you can't do that, you're not good enough. Yeah, I, I see some heads nodding. Some people recognize that little voice. When you do peripheral vision, that voice shuts up. So if you ever find yourself having that little voice saying you can't do it, switch to peripheral vision and it will stop. Now there is a downside to this one, you should be aware of. When you do peripheral vision really well, it relaxes all the muscles in your face and you start to look a little bit stoned. <laughs> <laughs> so you might not want to do this one in a business meeting. Just be aware. Okay, heart breathing. Um, somebody had mentioned heart math earlier. This is all based on research out of there. It sounds a little woo-woo, which some of us will be totally comfortable with and some of us will not. Uh, but I assure you that there is a ton of science in behind this. So I'd just like you to notice, as you are breathing in and out, I would like you to visualize that air that you're breathing in and out going through your heart. So breathing out through your heart and breathing in through your heart. And breathing out through your heart and breathing back in through your heart. And it sounds kind of crazy, but what you're doing is actually slowing the frequency of your brain. And the way this works is because physics tells us that two fields at different frequencies, when they come into contact with each other, will start to change and the weaker one will start to match the frequency of the stronger one. We are a bioelectrical system. <coughs> our heart is the largest source of electrical signals in our body. We can measure the electrical field put out from our heart 
to about four feet outside our bodies. Our brain is also a source of electrical frequency, and we can measure that one as well. And when we do this visualization, we are forcing the two of them to start synchronizing through a, a process called entrainment. So that's when the two frequencies start to match. So through brainwave entrainment, the two frequencies start to match. The stronger one, which is the heart, dominates, and the frequency of the brain now starts to slow to match the frequency of the heart. As it slows, we are less likely to trigger this because now we're less likely to go into that heightened state. So it sounds really weird, just visualizing breath, but it works astoundingly well at reducing the frequency of your brain. And if you want to actually see the research, heartmath.org is the place to go. They sell a whole bunch of devices and stuff that you can hook up and, and test out stuff. I don't use their devices, but I, I do love their research. They've got some interesting stuff there. Okay, next, uh, there's, the science shows that if you walk in nature for 20 minutes a day, you will have significantly lower cortisol levels. Cortisol, is, again, is that, the hormone that, that causes you to feel really crap. Say, uh, in nature, Mike, anywhere outside, or just has to be here? The, the study specifically said nature, so I don't think outside walking on a city street is going to give you the same benefit, but if you go to a park, 20 minutes outside. Originally, I, I had been telling people it was just 20 minutes, period, we'll drop it. I reread the research this week, and it actually says 20 minutes per day. So as a regular practice, if you're out in nature spending 20 minutes, you will have measurably lower cortisol levels. But not the nature with the bears. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of like the bears, so. Mike, it's not that, the states, though. Okay. Is that the same as watching nature shows, or do you have to actually physically be in the nature? And you still get that? I've, Apparently, I've seen references that if you just visualize this effectively enough, it's good enough because our brains really can't tell the difference. But not unless you're really experienced at meditation, most of us cannot hold something in our in our processes up for 20 minutes at a time. You're also engaging other senses, uh, the yeah. smell of the forest and that kind of thing is, is part of the yeah. experience. So get out in nature, get out to a park. Uh, the next one is belly laughing. It's, it's astounding what, what happens uh, neurologically if I can get somebody to laugh. If I can get even somebody to smile when I'm teaching something, then we get a little bit of dopamine, we get a little bit of oxytocin, we get a little bit of serotonin, and sometimes, sometimes we get a little bit of endorphins. If I can get somebody to laugh in a class, I get the, the dopamine, the serotonin, and the oxytocin automatically. I get a big shot of endorphins. And the endorphins are what make you feel really good. So if you were to jump out of a plane, people who are inclined to do that sort of thing, you get this massive endorphin rush because your body is convinced you're about to die. And so it floods you with endorphins so that you won't feel the pain when you hit the ground, but you don't hit the plane, the ground, because your parachute catches you. And so now you've got this flood of feel-good chemicals. Belly laughing will trigger those same endorphins because the funny thing is that when you are really laughing hard, you're causing so much friction around your internal organs that it is actually doing a little bit of damage. And so you get this flood of endorphins so you don't feel that. But we've all had the experience that you laugh so hard that you start to hurt. Yeah. Well, that's because the endorphins have stopped. <laughs> it was hurting the whole time through, you just didn't feel it. <laughs> So belly laughing, and the interesting thing about this one is that your brain can't distinguish between a real laugh and a fake laugh. So if you just do a fake laugh and fake your way through it, it will release all of the same neurotransmitters, the dopamine, the oxytocin, and the serotonin, and the endorphins. You'll get all of those things, and as those things go up, your cortisol starts to go down, which was the whole point of this, because if we can get our serotonin up, our cortisol starts, our cortisol starts to drop, and we get back into a, a better place. We're not feeling this crap. Okay, next one is the Wonder Woman or Superman pose. Uh, Amy Cuddy has a, an awesome TED talk where she talks about this, but the Superman or Wonder Woman pose is basically just this. Just standing like this. If you stand like this for two minutes, your testosterone will go up by 20% and your cortisol will go down by 25% in two minutes, just standing like this. I know it sounds crazy, but Amy Cuddy did a whole ton of research on this. She brought research people, research samples in. They would do a saliva test they get people to stand like this for two minutes, they do another saliva test, and they would get these measurements. 20% up on testosterone, 25% down on cortisol. Two minutes. 
So she recommends doing that for job interviews, for presenting. Any time you've got a stressful situation come up, just go and find a quiet spot all by yourself and just stand like this for two minutes. Now, I can I understand some of what's going on there uh, because when we are, are in a state of anxiety, we do tend to come into the center. We cover our center line because this is survival techniques. And so when we are forcing ourselves back into a, a broader state, just like with the job, we are telling the body, the brain, that we don't have a problem, that we're not in danger. Yes? Do you know why it's that? Like, you just explain, like, every year. I know a little bit of it. Um, I'm actually reading her book now, but she hasn't got to that part. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know that she's got research that, that backs it up, but other than the, the fact that we're tricking the body into believing that we're not in danger, I don't know why we get such dramatic numbers here. I'm hoping that she actually has some numbers further on in the book. <coughs> I was reading that on the way here yesterday. Uh, anyway, she has a TED talk. It's brilliant. I highly recommend it. Okay, now stepping into psychology for a moment instead of straight neuroscience. If you ever find yourself when I when I do this this kind of a talk, I get huge numbers of people coming up to me and saying, "Oh, I'm so anxious. I am an anxious person." The moment you say that, you are giving that anxiety tremendous power over you because you've just made it an identity statement. There's a model that I'm not going to go into because I could spend the whole hour just talking about this model, about how things at different levels are, have more and more power over us. The point is that saying I'm anxious has incredible power over us and we believe it implicitly. If I can reframe that to I'm feeling unsafe, all of a sudden we've taken that down to the bottom of the stack and it has almost no power over us. This is psychology. So anytime you find yourself saying, I am anxious, or even, I have anxiety, think instead, I'm feeling unsafe. And you're tricking your brain into going down to the next level. So you, you've, given, you've taken away all of its power over you. Does that make sense? OK, now we get down to this last one here. And the, the reason I teach this one last is because I have no idea why it works. I just know that it does. So this is a tapping regime. Many of you will have tried tapping before. There's a whole, there's large numbers of schools of tapping. I do the simplest one that I've found. It's a six point tapping technique. So I'd like you to try along with me. So get one hand nice and loose. And we're just gonna be tapping along and I do want you to say the words I'm saying after I say them. So, that anxiety. That anxiety. Letting it go. Tapping the center. Letting it go. Side of the eyes. Letting it, go. Letting it go. The words aren't important. What's important is that you are focusing under the eyes. Letting it go. You don't need it anymore. On the breastbone. Tapping it here. Letting it go. Then grabbing the other wrist, taking a deep breath. And that's it. Had you started, had you done the suds check of, on a scale of 0 to 10, and you've come up with a high number, one pass through that would have taken you down right away. If you're going to do this, do multiple passes until it gets down to a zero. A lot of times people will say, oh, I'm at a three. I feel great now. I can stop. If you stop at a three, it's going to come back. Keep going. Do it multiple passes until it's completely gone, and it won't come back in the short term. Um, now ultimately, things may happen to bring it back later. If you do multiple rounds and you find it's not working, likely you're dehydrated. Go and drink something and then try it again. And in very rare circumstances, if it's not working and you're, you've already had some glasses of water, there might be too much electrical interference where you are. Go to a different room and try it again. And it will probably work at that point. I can't explain why it works, but there is a lot of science that shows that acupuncture points are tied to various aspects of health. And every one of these six, well, every one of the first five points are acupuncture points. And the sixth one, we are anchoring it to our breath. So we're making it more likely that as we breathe on a regular basis that we are starting to calm ourselves down. So that's EFT. And again, there's lots and lots of flavors of EFT. Some of them are incredibly complicated. I like the really simple six-point tapping. What is EFT? Emotional freedom technique. Freedom? Yeah. Yes? How many times should you tap? Until it's gone. Oh, how many, how many times for on each time? Yeah. Until you've had enough. <laughs> <laughs> 
if, if I'm going through something really intense, I'll, I'll tend to stay longer at each point. If, it, if I'm doing something mild, I won't go as long. I've done this on everything from uh, physical pain, uh, emotional pain. Uh, my son, when he had braces, got his braces tightened one day, so he had physical, physical tooth pain. Two rounds of tapping and the pain was gone. I can't explain it. I know it works. My wife came home with nausea one day. My wife's a complete skeptic for all these things. <laughs> and and uh, she came home and she, she was feeling nauseous. She thought she was gonna throw up. I said, you wanna try the tapping? It's not gonna work. <laughs> well, let's, you got nothing to lose. Let's try it. A couple of rounds of tapping, the nausea was gone. Does she have to tap it herself? Yeah, she has to tap it. <laughs> well, interestingly, I know somebody who does this work on horses and she puts one hand on the horse and she taps herself and the horse actually shows, no, you, you, you can't explain this by placebo effect because the horse doesn't know what you're doing. <laughs> but horses will calm down when you do this. I, again, I can't explain it. There's something there. I use it. I just can't explain it. Can you repeat what the points are? It's top of the head, which is the anxiety point in uh, Chinese medicine. It's the center of the forehead, side of the eye, under the eye, okay. breastbone. And I do have a picture with that if you anybody wants to see. Yes. So where do you connect this back to the agile coaching or like how would we use this in uh, Oh, because very simply if investors? if I'm sitting down with somebody yeah. who I'm trying to coach and they are in a th <laughs> up here, I can't coach them. There's nothing that I can say or do that will help them. But if I can show them some techniques to get them back down to here to rest and digest, now I can coach them. I guess my question is if they're in that state already are they prepared to do something that feels weird? Even? Like, have, you, have you found that? Like, yeah. I'm, like, I'm thinking of my son, too, for exams. <laughs> yeah, well, it's best if you've explained this stuff before. Yeah. So I come into yeah. clients, and I will do this workshop that we're doing here. I will do it clients. And then we're in a coaching environment, and I say, oh, you, you seem to be a little stressed today. <clears throat> Are you willing to try that thing that we talked about at the lunch alert? Can I also give? ourselves to be in that space of rest and digest because uh, if things go wrong if, uh, you know we are also there panicking I don't know if we are helping who <laughs> needs a prefrontal cortex right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that was actually something that I, I forgot to mention earlier that Tom just reminded me but when we got somebody going through this all the time people who are highly stressed tend to get sick a lot you may have noticed that that's because their immune systems up and down yeah. constantly and people who are highly stressed don't make good decisions, that's because their prefrontal cortex is up and down. Well, if we can get them to stay in a rest and digest state, they're thinking more rationally, they're gonna be healthier, they're certainly gonna be happier. And they're gonna be, if, if they attribute us to the success of them feeling better, they're gonna be more likely and receptive to coaching. Like, can you go through the peripheral vision uh, technique one more time? Peripheral vision. Oh, peripheral vision, yes. Okay, so find a spot on the wall. Just to find a spot somewhere that you can look at. Um, as you're focusing on it right now, you're in foveal, so now start to expand your awareness outwards. So move your eyes. Without, without, without moving your eyes, moving, uh, without moving your eyes, just become aware of things out to the side. So sometimes you can do this with yourself. Just take your fingers and move your fingers out far. At what point do you lose sight of them? I can still see the left one, the, the right one's disappeared now. But as you expand more and more outwards, you're now in peripheral vision. <clears throat> and I use that one all the time. So if I really want that dessert, but I know I shouldn't, I switch to peripheral vision and the craving's gone. If I really want that second glass of wine and I know I shouldn't, peripheral vision and the craving's gone. Just like that. So different things work at different levels for different people, so it's not always the same technique. For me, peripheral vision is one of my go-tos. I use that all the time. It has a funny use. Uh, if, if you're comfortable using it, I, I am learning from the same sources. Um, if you walk through crowds, you walk through a crowd and still think, okay, I can't even you know, make, make any progress. If you switch to peripheral vision, it's like nobody's there. Mm -hmm. and you don't hit anyone. Mm -hmm. Because you're seeing the gaps instead of the people. You're seeing the gaps, and, and you just don't collide with anyone. It's, it's like a miracle. Interesting. I, I haven't tried that. Yeah, I, I, I do the circle all the time. Yes. 
part of that. Something in this afternoon. <laughs> you have a question? Yeah, um, the oxygen to the lungs, because mm -hmm. it feels like you usually stop breathing when you're scared, so how, how is that? Right, well, yeah, because it, it's getting us ready for fight or flight, and for both of those, our ox the lungs have to be functioning. So we are pumping more in, but the lungs are still constricting. So even though we've got more oxygen going into the lungs, the lungs are compressed as you, you know, you're, you're feeling that, that shortness of breath, but there is still more oxygen being pumped into it. So I realize it's somewhat contradictory, but the brain is trying to get us to that point. And were you to start running, the lungs would open up and you would, you would get going. But when we're in that freeze response, that's... So on that note, there's a second part to my snake story. And this is totally a true story. Somebody accused me of making this up because snakes are against me. But this is true, I saw this snake. And so after that snake had slithered away, because it, I'm from Ontario, and I know there's only one dangerous snake in Ontario. It's the Massasauga rattler. You don't find them in populated areas. And so in Ontario, I would have known immediately if the snake was dangerous or not. But I'm in Texas, and I don't know, and I still don't know whether that particular snake was dangerous. But so I walked a ways down the path, and then because I wanted to get past it, and then I pull out my phone and I'm Googling, trying to figure out, is this a venomous snake or not? And as I'm Googling it, out of the corner of my eye, I see another snake almost on top of my foot. <laughs> well, this time I didn't freeze because it wasn't that far away. It was really close. This time I jumped, and I think I let out a yell. <laughs> but in any case, I jumped, and the snake got scared and ran away. But the point is my, my brain had responded in exactly the same way. It had kicked me up to here, but it determined that a freeze was not appropriate in the second time, that uh, flight was, was, was appropriate in the second one, and it took me vertically, which was an interesting move because I was gonna come right back down on top of the snake. So that, I don't know that that was all that helpful, but it did scare the snake and it, it fled. And I still don't know if it was venomous. Uh, these all sound like really great techniques when you may be in a situation where you, you want to calm down. But if you start to use these just regularly, you might start to sort of be in denial about what's causing that situation. So I don't know, on the reframe, you kind of went through that a bit mm -hmm. quickly. Can, can you come back to that on the different factors okay. of acknowledging you know, what's causing this? Okay, so, so just the see if I've got the essence of it. If we're doing a lot of these techniques, we may be hiding the fact that I might have a real problem underneath. Yeah. So yes, if you're doing this stuff on a regular basis and it's not just going away and staying away, if it keeps coming back, you probably have deeper underlying issues and you, could seek, you should seek out a therapist. Okay. That's, that's, <laughs> I was just curious what things you have But, but for the reframe, I mean, this, this is all good. To, when you go to a therapist, this is one of the things they're gonna tell you to do. I actually learned this from a therapist. Well, actually I learned all of this from a therapist, but. <laughs> Because I do, although I don't teach therapy, I do study therapy. I learned all of this from a, a hypnotherapist in New York. Um, so yeah, they will tell you to do this kind of thing anyway, but if the problem keeps coming back after we've done this, then likely there's some deeper issue. There might be trauma, there might be some external force. So yes, at that point you want to seek out therapy. But in the meantime, there's no point in feeling crappy. Just do this, feel better, and now go and set up an appointment. But well, there is a difference. The model you have on the right logical level, that one is something that, based on the stories we tell ourselves, so if I say, you know, I'm anxious, am I an anxious person or am I feeling anxious right now? The techniques are very, they're reactive. Okay, but that one is like, what, what do I tell myself? Which is something I do all the time. <coughs> so the language actually matters. Uh, when I've used that technique with people, uh, and this is especially true in a city like ours with people who speak multiple languages, uh, switch to your native tongue. And see what you tell yourself in your native tongue. And sometimes it will make things easier and sometimes it will make it harder, right? Uh, but the exact words you use actually matter a whole lot. Yeah. yeah and if I can just add to that, like there's, a, there's a space in between an event happening and how you respond to it. So to, the same event happening to two people on two different days is gonna one person's going to get upset, and the other person's going to not even listen. So there's also work I think even before this, trying to figure out, okay, why? I, what is it about this thing that's causing me stress, and is that worth it? Yeah. Like, yeah, well, there absolutely. Are all other layers to, to, to yeah, I, I would suggest that you likely are going to want to jump on these things first, because until you've done this, you won't be in a rational enough place to be able to, to have that conversation with yourself. 
So this is just get yourself back to a calmer place and now reflect. What was, did I just overreact to something in my, envir my environment or is there actually a problem here or is there a deeper issue or, so was that helpful? Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Like, what is the role of the sensations? Uh, like, are they coming before you react or like, based on your studies? Well, it, it starts the moment you leave, rest, and digest. Because here, you're nice and calm, and everything's wonderful. And you are, at this point, you are your, your stomach is digesting properly, and everything is calm and relaxed, and you're in that good place. And then something happens to trigger you. And it, it's not an on or off. I should clarify it. This is, it's a scale. I mean, your amygdala, it, sometimes it just gives you a little bump. Hey, there's a problem. And sometimes it says, whoa, something bad went. My case with the snake, it was something... Something bad happened, so it sent me into immediate paralysis for a freeze response. But sometimes it's just, oh, there's, there's a little problem here. So that, that sensation, how bad you feel, well, it really, it's a response of how far into this did you go? How much time have you spent there? Because obviously it does build. The longer you have cortisol flooding your system, the, the worse you're gonna feel. Uh, cortisol does take a while to, to wear off. There were some interesting studies around pulse rates before and after you've been triggered. And it takes a long time. You, your pulse immediately jumps up, and it takes a long time to come back down again, and that's a function of cortisol. It's that chronic low level that's so damaging. When yes. you've got that persistent, constant attacks that kind of get you partway up there that are gonna gradually raise that cortisol level and, uh, and really create ill health, physically as well as mentally. There are a lot of people who consider themselves to be anxious who are in that half-triggered state most of the time. And when you're half-triggered, it's really easy to go all the way. Whereas if you're completely relaxed, it's a lot harder to, to be set off accidentally because your boss said something. But if you're already half-triggered and your boss says, I need to talk to you, well, you boom. Well, it, it's interesting that if we do something like mob programming, where we're all working together on a common thing, right. and we're all succeeding together, we get this whole flood of chemicals in our brain. So we're getting dopamine because we're solving problems. We're getting tons of oxytocin because that's the bonding chemical. So we're feeling part of a group, part of a community, doing something together. We're getting all of this oxytocin. We're getting a lot of serotonin going on. Serotonin is all about action. It's called the leadership drug quite often. Uh, but it's all around action, and typically as our serotonin goes up, our cortisol goes down. So if you, for example, if, if somebody's struggling to get through the door and I go in to hold the door for them, my brain gives me a shot of serotonin. If you witness me doing that, you also get a shot of serotonin. Just witnessing an act of generosity gives you a shot of serotonin. So when we are working together as a group in a mob or in a pair, and we're working collectively towards something, we're getting this huge flood of neurotransmitters which are helping to calm us back down again. Now, if only the drivers could get a piece of that action, then we'd be in better shape. <laughs> they, they do. Like, every time, like in traffic, you let someone go, and you observe them what they do in the next five minutes, and they let someone else go. So they actually do. Doesn't seem to cascade <laughs> somehow. <laughs> well, it's very easy Sometimes to get triggered. Yeah, so, if, uh, we're, so getting back to your point of how would we do this in a group setting, I get people to work together. When people are off working on their own, particularly in a stressful environment, that's when things are most likely to be up here. If we're working collectively on something, through mobbing, pairing, whatever, coming together, we're going to be getting this flood that's going to be helping keep cortisol in check. But at that point, I'm not teaching them about it. We're just we're working in a way that is actually conducive to us being healthier and happier. There's also this workshop, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I have started running this at clients. Yes? So you talked about people that are maybe sort of at a minimum level all the time. 
what's the right way to maybe broach that with somebody? Because you want to help them, but you don't necessarily want to accuse them of being anxious or stressed. Okay. I would say to that too is um, I find that for me, I always try to emulate people that are already doing what I want to do, right? So okay. I think I find that uh, if I work on myself, just like with kids, right? They won't do what I say; they'll do what I do. So if I just work on myself and continue to make myself better, then in theory, somebody's going that has something that they want to address and they see me addressing it, they'll, they'll tap me on the shoulder and say, "What are, what are you doing?" Because you know I want to be like you in that in that way, right? Whether it's your kids or or somebody at college. So I think. For me, the challenge I put on myself is you know, forget about them else, unless it's a specific context of that where that's the whole goal. But just if I continue to develop myself, then I, ideally I'll be able to help others and they will show themselves. Just like for me, you know, in any situation where, you know, uh, I can count back where for years a friend or somebody, a loved one has been telling me about something, but I completely ignore it, but they've been telling me the answer for years. And it takes me to come to my own revelation, yes, I need fix something about myself and then the answers are obvious and that person has the answer back for them so I just focus on myself and people ideally will come in and help that. In, uh, in hypnosis we call that being at threshold so we have to in order for somebody to make change they have to recognize that something has to change it has to be me and it has to be now and until those three conditions are true it doesn't matter so if somebody says you know help me quit smoking well you realize that, well, no, it's my wife wants me to quit smoking. Not good enough, not gonna work. Oh yeah, I, I wanna do it, but I'm not willing to make the change now. No, not good enough. So it has to be me, something has to change, it has to be me, it has to be now. That's being a threshold. And when somebody's there, it's easy to help them. When they're not there, there's nothing we can do. How to get folks to the threshold, right? Because think about it, change is difficult for everyone, right? Mm -hmm. So we know someone has a problem, we have the tools to help them solve the problem but making them realize that they have a problem and having you know having them be willing enough to accept that there's a problem and you know getting to that how, how do you do that right because you can't that, teach that's that that's tough right? and it's unique to every situation yeah. <laughs> that's a whole other workshop yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because see, that's the thing right there's all these tools that are very powerful and mm -hmm. they they work provided you are ready to exercise these and practice them regularly right right it's about getting folks that have the problem to understand that they have the problem, right? The first step of mm -hmm. being an alcoholic is accepting that you're alcoholic, things like that, right? So I think that that is a real struggle, right? Even in a, in a big workshop, let's say in an organization that is doing really complex work and he's stressed, we do a workshop like this, everyone sees this, but how do we get folks after the workshop to say, all right, so, you know, what is stage two from that point on, right? Right, and this is why I always uh, compare my coaching role as just planting seeds. Sometimes the seeds take and sometimes they don't. Mm. Well, I'm saying the same things every time, but one time you were ready for it and one time you weren't. Right. Mm. I, I think some, it helps to, to talk to people, like to listen to them, to maybe take that person aside one-on-one -on -one and, and um, let them talk a bit about what's going on. But to talk, to give them feedback, like can I give you some feedback and this typical coaching yeah, um, like did you, I, I realize it's probably not your intent, but did you realize when you have this behavior, it has this effect? And then they're actually, it's more tangible than saying you're stressed, because again, your stress goes up through the identity thing. But when you specify the behavior and say, I don't think you realize, but you may have this impact on the team. I, I've found some people, first of all, are not willing to have that conversation. But when people are, then they'll really, it, it kind of helps them open up to, to this. Mm -hmm. So I just keep repeating the message, and at some point they're going to be ready, and when they're ready, it'll happen. We have time for one or two more questions. Okay. And that stopped the question. <laughs> <laughs> I have one question. Yes. Um, I, it's great that you make a living out of this, right? Because usually, in my experience, everybody sticks to the technical, right, or the applicable, or at least visually applicable. So this. You're going to underline how to improve things on root cause stuff, which I think is great. But so, uh, how do you see that industry or that people like being open to what you're talking about, or people just brush you off in general? Well, it, it's funny that you position it that way because I sell myself as a tech coach. Mm -hmm. I come in and I teach developers how to program better, and I do all that stuff. But once I'm in the door, I do everything. 
And do you find the, 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 how's the reception? And the reception has been surprisingly good. I thought people would be really weird today when I talked about hypnosis and yeah. neuroscience and all that sort of stuff, and people have been very open and receptive to it. And do you have an opinion as to why? Why they were receptive? I don't know. I think it's probably a better question. Why did I think they would be all weird today? Because they're suffering. Because they're suffering, right? This is, this is part of a toolkit. You, as, a, as a coach, you want to have access to a lot of different ways of tackling problems. And part of the, part of the job is, is being able to select the appropriate tool for the job. And the more you have, the more likely you are to be able to do that. And Mike clearly has uh, both the ability to deliver this kind of solution, but also to recognize when it's appropriate. And for me, like just understanding the underpinnings of human physiology, human psychology, is really, really important in terms of just recognizing, like we don't, we think we have a prefrontal cortex that guides our behavior, and we really don't. We're all about those feelings and you know, the, the primitive impulses that guide our behavior. And the more you kind of handle on that, and the biases that inform what we do, the better able you are to kind of look at a situation and see behind the scenes what's going on, and then again, pick the right tool for the job. Like if you yourself have a good intention when you approach other people and you're able to empathize with them and to love them, then they feel this and they'll they'll respond. If you just want to make some tool work, right? Maybe they won't respond. So it uh, depends on your attitude. Yeah, and if I could just add the last thing is that it's really knowing your audience. That had I started this whole presentation with heart breathing and tapping, half of you would have immediately disengaged and not paid attention. Yeah. But I started with neuroscience. And so by the time I got here, everybody was following along. So it's really knowing your audience and knowing where to start. Because I know if somebody had come to me before I knew this stuff straight with heart breathing and tapping, it was, yeah, it's not for me, I'm gonna go somewhere else. But we start with science, by the time we get over there, we're fine. And then the people who would have been fine right from the beginning, they, they don't really care about the neuroscience necessarily, but yeah, okay, I'll play along with that until we get to the stuff that's interesting. So knowing how you're going to pitch it and how you're going to coach it. Does that help? OK, uh, lastly, shameless self-promotion. I do have a website where I talk about things like this. It's Unconscious Agile. I have stickers up here because everybody loves stickers. Thank you everyone for coming. Just two quick announcements. If you are, um, tomorrow there is a coaching gathering happening if you are interested in learning about some coaching techniques. They provide us with agile lunch that you can get 10% discount off that. Um, and uh, July 30th we are going to have Klaus Lepel talking about what team doesn't have to do anything with business agility. It's a webinar. Um, I'm going to put this uh, stuff on the um, meetup information. And again, thanks Mike for coming here and giving us some information not only to use but uh, for health reason even you said you do that and mm -hmm. I'm going to use this paper yeah, yeah. and I want to have more ice cream tonight <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you guys Excuse my artwork. Yeah, okay. It's all relative, right? <laughs> <laughs>